Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the Wood by Wright live event and we do this every Tuesday at about 8 p.m. Eastern uh, Central Time and so we're going to be having a little bit of fun today. We are making uh, finger joints or box joints and this is just the, the simple version of dovetails that don't actually connect together. <laughs> so this should be kind of interesting. Uh, box joints are not something that you generally do with hand tools. They are very, very common in the power tool world because they're very easy to cut on power tools and they're a little more difficult with hand tools, but there are some times when you want to have them. So we'll be talking about that in a little bit here. Um, notifications, if you are new, if you look down in the description below, I will have links to all of the questions that are being asked in the live group. Uh, that's if you aren't watching this live. If you are watching this live, those questions won't be down there because you haven't asked those questions yet. Uh, if you are live, feel free to ask the questions in there. My wife will collate them and then uh, ship them on to me. And you can see my wife down there. Hi, Sarah. And it was her birthday yesterday. So um, happy birthday, Sarah. You want to show them your present? Yeah. Although, <laughs> my only present. <laughs> you got her a, a squirrel tail plane because you know she was she she said she liked it, so that was the only thing she hinted at. The only thing I the saw that she hinted at. The only thing I hinted. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do have one other present coming, but it hasn't come yet. I was waiting for that so because I, I know you know me better than that. <laughs> <laughs> but it is cute. <laughs> size. It's a size hand plane. It's a it's turtle size for your convenience. It's very Merry Christmas too. <laughs> oh um, dear, I just opened myself up for a wealth of short elf jokes right there. <laughs> yes, Sarah. Good thing Alan's not on tonight. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's missing out on. Um, let's see. Oh, we have um, an event coming up here soon in on July. Uh, let's see, 13th, 14th, and 15th, we're having the Midwest Tool Collectors Association National Meet. This is the largest sale of hand tools in the world. It will be taking place in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, it's a three-day long event to do with hand tools and historical uh, information and talks about the history of them as well as the tool sales, both outside and inside, and it is thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hand tools for sale. A lot of time. Um, and I will be there. I'll be doing a talk on Thursday. You do have to be a member of the Midwest Tool Collectors to go to it. Um, and uh, you have to be a member to then um, to get into the event. So um, go and join and come and feel free to say hi and hang out. I might be doing a meetup. We'll be seeing. I'll be there Thursday and Friday. I won't be able to be there Saturday. So on Thursday, I'll also be doing a, a talk. Um, yeah, so that should be fun. I think I'm missing on that. I don't think so. I don't have any other events on my schedule after that. Um, might be traveling out west. I'm looking at something for that. Yeah, you're ditching me. I do that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so uh, let's dive into finger joints. Um, or I can keep calling them finger joints. Box joints. Um, box joint is the more technical term. Uh, finger joints are anything that interlocks. Technically, dovetails are also a finger joint. Uh, there are a bunch of joints that fall into the category of finger joints, anything that, that connects past each other. Uh, box joints are a very, very simple joint, a uh, simple form of you finger joints. Fuzzy. Do I? But it could well, be here, let me switch out to they this. They might be dirty. <laughs> so these are our box joints, and on a table saw, they're really easy because you can just run it through and cut out the notches with a dado stack or even with single blades and a bunch of them, and then they fit together. They just have to be perfectly square, and they connect together with hand tools. It's just as easy to make these as it is to make a dovetail. And in some cases, it's actually easier to make a dovetail because you can be ever so slightly off on one or the other. On this, they have to be perfectly 90 degrees in all aspects. And that actually makes them a little bit more difficult. Uh, you see these done a lot of times with power tools, but not so much with hand tools. And then to make them a little bit more fancy, I'm making them pillowed or proud. And that just makes them look a little bit better. And that's one of the things you can do with hand tools, just to sharpen them up that makes it a little bit more difficult to do this with power tools. So tonight we're going to be doing that. So we're going to take these boards, flip them around, and we're going to make um, finger joints on this end. Are you using your favorite white oak, or are you using something different? Uh, no, this is that fake mahogany that I've been working with. Um, it is um, Filipino mahogany. Um, it's a good bit softer, often used in boats. Uh, it has a pretty good uh, exterior usage. So while I'm getting this set up, any questions yet? 
Uh, Jacob Meadows asks, why don't metal planes burnish wood as much as wooden planes? Um, that is a really good question. And that really depends on how you are judging your burnishing. <laughs> uh, wooden planes create more friction. There, there is more of a, uh, a physical contact, whereas steel slides a little bit easier. Um, and so because of that friction, you're actually heating up the wood. Uh, that's my guess. Technically, scientifically, I honestly don't know. So um, let's switch over to this one. And now you can see on this, I want to actually lay these out. And I'm going to use a pair of dividers here and step this out. And I have this one stepped out to split into four even chunks. With dovetails, you usually want to make an odd number so that you can have tails and pins. But with finger joints, I actually like to have an even number on here uh, so that I have this odd one on here. I like the look of the odd, especially with doing the proud uh, pins on here. It just, it's kind of sharp to me. Then I'm gonna take a square, put that across there. If you put your marking knife into the hole, slide the square up against it, lock it down, and then slide it over. Mark the top, mark the next one, Flip it over so we can get to the last one here and mark that one as well. Now that we have the top marked, we need to mark down, but we need to know how far to mark down. Normally, I would take my other board and I'd set up my marking gauge and find out how wide that is, and then I'd mark that out. But I want these to be proud, so I'm going to set it on there and then I'm going to go an eighth inch more. And with this one with the roller head on here, you can also see I have the, the roller head on here, so I just have the board sticking out to there and the distance from here to the outside face is 1 8 inch. So I'm going to have these pillows sticking out 1 8 inch farther than the board. So I'm going to grab this and run around this board, three sides. One, two, and three. So that's my depth of cut. Now I need to lay out my lines to cut down to that depth. So just as before, I'm going to set my, mark, my knife into that line slide the square up against it and then mark down to that spot same thing over here set my knife in there slide down to that spot and flip it around so that i have a good reference surface if i have it over here i have very little actual material that is referencing on here whereas if i flip it around i can get better over here set the knife in slide the square up against it and slide down and we have a thunderstorm going on so if i suddenly disappear it's probably because we had a power outage now I want to mark these. I want to cut this one out, and I want to cut this one out. Um, I'm not going to be marking down the back side of the board, um, just because I cut straight enough that I don't have to worry about that. If you want to, then you can also mark down the back side of the board as well. Any questions while I move that around? Yes. Scott Swineford asked, how do you sharpen molding planes? Ah, I really want to do that video, and I'm actually thinking I might do that video for Thursday. Um, because it is incredibly simple. It's literally taking sandpaper and putting it on a dowel and sharpening it just like you would any other plane. <laughs> and a lot of people really like to overthink it, but it doesn't, uh, um, yeah, not something to really worry about that much. So I might be doing a video on that Thursday. It's one I've been wanting to do for a long time. I think I finally have the impetus to do it. So stay tuned. Um, oh, I moved that over. So, oh my word, that is out of focus. Okay, there so it wasn't just my glasses. Well, no, that oh that camera oh. might be out of focus too. Let me switch this one. Oh yeah, that one's out of focus too. Here, I gotta focus down on there. There, and that'll be a little better on there. It's hard to tell. I gotta go get my glasses. So let's move this back over. And now we're going to cut down on this. So I have my dovetail saw. This is one from Bearcat Woodworking. And I just love his design on this. Beautiful saw. If you want one of these, good luck. Um, he is back ordered big time on them. And so just like with a dovetail, I'm going to cut down this, set in the line, establish the cut, and then cut down to depth. Right there. Now I want to show you a little trick in this, and that is looking at the reflection in the saw. Sorry, there we go. So when I put this on here, I can look at the reflection on here, and you can see how it tips down there, and now it's tipping up. If I go and tell that reflection looks like it's an extension of the board, I know my saw is perfectly up and down. So I can look at that reflection, let me set this on here, 
I can look at that reflection and know that I'm cutting straight up and down. And lo and behold, just looking at the reflection, I was able to follow that line all the way down. So that's one of those fun tips that once you get used to looking at the reflection, you can cut straight anytime on just about any board. That's all it takes, just like that. Cool, anything while I'm flipping this around? Uh, so in reference to the molding plane, Jacob Meadows wanted to know how about the sole of the molding plane for sharpening like that. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, the sole just should match the iron, or you can match the iron to the sole, and it can be anything you want. There's nothing particular that says one has to be exactly exactly what it is unless you're matching an existing molding. Um, so, yeah. One of those things that some people really worry about and some people really don't. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you can cut the sole of a molding plane with a master molding plane or a mother molding plane, which is what you actually would cut it with, or you could carve it by hand, which sounds really scary, or you could sand it. Um, there's a bunch of different ways of doing it, or setting files on there and filing it down. Okay. Um, what's that? I was going to say, you guys switch cameras before yep. you say <laughs> So now, we want to cut this one down. The nice thing about having an odd tooth is that there's always one that has to be cut. So we're going to do the same thing, look at that reflection. Like that. I'm going to come in with the chisel while I have it here and plane it right back. I just stayed a hair away from that line so that I could come back and plane it in. I love having a really nice sharp chisel. Makes everything so much more happy. <laughs> happy little wood curls. What? That sigh. <laughs> There's a little Bob Ross in me. <laughs> Any questions while I'm cleaning this? Let's see. Moon Wolf 71 wants to know where you got your marking knife. Uh, that was made for me by... Um, oh, what is his name? Um, uh, Dan the Maker Man, YouTube channel. It is my absolute favorite shape. I love this marking knife. Um, and he makes them for a few other people. But yeah, it's it's just it's can't a great that, marking knife. So you know. What's that? They can't oh yeah, there it's out of the go. there you go, sorry. So I just want to take the file here while I'm here and clean up this face. Just smooth it out. And at this point I want to bring in a square and check that I'm square here. And I need to do a little more work on there. And I also want to make sure that I'm square here, because this has got to be square in every definition of square. And then I should also be square this way um, so you just want to make sure that you are square in every direction except for i need to clean this up a little bit That's something i just saw i'm out of square just another shaving right here right there so let's check that again yeah see that's what i'm looking for so now we're square there now we need to cut out this waste and i don't always use a coping saw but in this case the coping saw is a good bit faster um, due to how soft this wood is and with how little I'm doing in here. So I want to put it down in, in with the blade, and I, as, as I pull it back, and I'm having it cutting on the pole here, as I pull it back, that's when I want to turn. I don't want to turn it and then cut it. I want to cut and pull all in one movement. And that way my turning is done while the teeth are engaged and working. that block. Then we can come in and do the same thing again. I cut it close enough. I can just put it right into that marking gauge line and cut across. Right in the marking gauge line. Cut across. Turn around. Do the same thing from the other side. A little higher on this side so I gotta take a little bit off and a little bit off. And then down. Any other questions right now? Um, so follow up to the marking knife question. Is it beveled only on one side? Um, yes, though it has 
it's it's bevel and bevel but then flat on this side so this is always a reference side and it always cuts that so that's the way I like it. I don't like a double beveled marking knife. I find that to be annoying. But again, personal preference. So now we're just going to come in here, clean this out a little bit, take it back to the lines. There we go. Nice, clean, sharp box joint, just like that. Now I want to transfer those lines onto this. And I'm going to do this the exact same way that I did it with, that I do it with dovetails um, and that is I mean, if you really 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 trust your work you could just pace it out mark it off and do it again but if there's any slight deviation between reality and what you're hoping reality is then it's going to be off so I just find it easier to set it up on here pull this back line everything up use the marking knife let me move this around for you Use the marking knife and set it all out. So I can eyeball down, referencing off of here, making sure that's flush up with that. There's in line with that. There's in line with that. Then I can hold this down, put my knife in here, draw a line across, draw a line across, draw a line across. And then before taking it away, I'm going to come in here and mark you and you so that I know what I need to take out. Oh, I didn't check this. Make sure that I'm square there. I felt pretty good about that. Yeah, that's good and square. Yep, I like that. All right, uh, then we need to do exactly what we did before. Set up the depth gauge. Run around this. Give yourself a depth of cut. Then square it on the line. Let me lift it up a little bit. Square down the line so you know what to cut on, and then cut it out. You just want to make sure at this point you stay on the right side of the line. So I drew the X on the top. That's the side that I want to stay on. Um, otherwise, it's going to have a big gap, the thickness of your blade. So there we go. Now you just cut this thing down, and we'll have fingers to fit together. What questions we got? So Jerome Cornet asked, any reason why you're not ganging up the boards to cut si both sides together, assuming you offset both by one finger? <laughs> that comes down to reality. Um, if I really trusted my measurements and marking to gang them off and make them all exact, then I could do that. But if I'm ever so slightly off, I mean, if I am off by the thickness of the sawtooth set, that doubles. So if I'm cutting them together, I'm doubling the variance. So if any amount I'm off, I'm twice that amount. So if I'm off by a 64th of an inch, then I'm suddenly actually off by a 32nd. There's a 32nd of an inch gap in there. And a 32nd of an inch gap is a very visible gap. Um, so, yeah, and that's just being off by a 64th in your saw cut. Um, so, ganging them up, if you really trust yourself and you know what you're doing and you're that skilled for it, go for it. But I'm not that skilled. <laughs> Although, one of these days I've got to try that and just see, you know, how it actually comes out. Just stay on the right side of the line. Look at the reflection. cut down. This on the left side of the line, start it, look at the reflection, and cut down. Same thing again. Same thing again. I feel like I've been here before. I'm going to cut out the waist in between while I have it up. The chunk comes out, pair out the extra, leave it close enough that I can pair it out and just put it right into the marking gauge line. Some people like to stay away from that marking gauge line about an eighth inch or more, and you'll have to pair out a couple times. 
um, I say, eh, just get close to it. But I trust my saw work. Um, if you don't trust your saw work and being able to cut right up on that line, then cutting that close to the line may be a disastrous move. Any questions on pairing? Um, let's see. Gary Joy asks, do you know how to make a treasure chest? Uh, I'm assuming you were referring to the bowed top, as that is what most people think automatically when they think of treasure chest. Um, I have never done that, but yes, I know how to. It's coopering. So the exact same way you would make a barrel, um, just do that at the top of the chest. Although I do want to do some coopering work. That would be a lot of fun. Just haven't gotten around to it. There we go. And let's actually do some testing here. Ooh, I'm liking that. It's looking good. Now we're going to do the same thing on this last little piece here. Cut down, pair out, and we'll be ready to test these together. Any other questions? Uh, let's see. Wood looks quite greeny. Is it common for that species? Yes. Um, yeah. It looks far more greeny than it is. It cuts very smooth, cuts very silky. It's a very easy wood to work. And I actually buy it at Menards, the local big box store. Um, it's relatively cheap from the big box store. Though, as boards go and in board foot price, it's fairly expensive. There's that, and that, test that for square, that's what I'm looking for, and I think I just need to do a little file work and we'll be ready to test this thing. So let's see what we got, let me just ch check this for square, and that for square, okay now here we go, here's what happens. Very rarely do these fit. Now, theoretically, it should be able to go through together this way, and it should be able to go together this way. So it shouldn't matter which way they go together, but it probably does. Let's see what we got. Actually, that's not bad, but I think it goes the other way. Because I drew the line from one to the other, one way will probably fit a little bit cleaner. Yeah, yeah, see, that's the way it's supposed to go. That's a really nice, clean joint. Good fit there. So these are all proud, about an eighth of an inch. The next thing I want to do is actually mark out, ooh, that actually feels really good. Uh, next thing I want to do is actually mark out how far they are proud so that I know where to trim them back. So I can set this on here, and then I'm gonna take the knife and mark off where they extend out. I'm not gonna mark them really heavy, just a nice light line all the way across each of the intersecting points on all sides. And this is going to get most of the points, though some of them... Oh, they're asking about switching camera. What's that? Oh, am I still on that one? I'm sorry. I was thinking I was on this one. Sorry about that. Here. Let's focus that in. I'm sorry about that. I thought I was on this one. So what we're actually going to do is come in here and then mark off where they intersect. So I know exactly how much these protrude out the side, and that will make it easier to pillow them, or in this case, chamfer them. What? Someone else is taking over the sass for Alan while he's gone. <laughs> His absence is missed. I, I had to Facebook him that. <laughs> uh, so the one thing you're going to see on here is that there is one side that doesn't have a line. So if I want to, I could set the square on here across those, and then use that to create that line on there that I can't get. Just like that, I forgot to do that on this side. And that way I get that line running all the way around and I'm not putting it that heavy. I'm just doing a light cut, a light cut, just enough so I can actually see it. There we go. Now we can take these apart and I've got these lines running around there that I can chamfer to. So let me zoom in a little bit and show you these. I don't know if you'll be act actually, oh yeah, I think we can actually see those lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. When you decide to stop moving. There we go. And so now I'm gonna grab 
my, uh, what is this, eight millimeter? Yeah, eight millimeter. And I'm just gonna pair off. Uh, no, we're gonna sharpen first. Because when I'm doing this, I really, really need them to be sharp. So I always keep a strop here on the bench. Speaking of which, you can buy a strop in my shop. Wood by right strops. <laughs> Made with genuine horse butt leather. The best you can get. Get it. Um, What's that? There's a question since you're sharpening. Scott Swainford asks, any thoughts on sharpening a draw knife? As several dings in a small area still cuts very well and a few dings towards the handles. Yeah, I'm going to take you back to the stone. You're actually bad. Uh, I actually have a video on sharpening draw knives, if you want to see that. Um, and it's one of those things you just got to... Um, <laughs> you take the stone to the draw knife, not the draw knife to the stone. Just take your time. Now, this last little bit here, if I just push this off, I'm going to break off these fibers here. So what I actually want to do is shear it. So as I push forward, I'm also going to pull and let it slide past. Just little bit by little bit. If I do it right, I'll be able to shear those off without breaking off the fibers, just like that. And I can do the same thing this way. I'm going to cut down about halfway. Now, if I really wanted to be precise, what I would do is come in with a marking knife, or with a, um, um, a marking gauge, and I would put in a line on the top so just like we have a line down, I would come in and I would put in a line across the top that I would know where to go to. But in this case, I've done this enough that I can just eyeball about where 45 is at and get it relatively close. And because I already have that one cut at a 45, I can just push it and it cuts pretty well. There's that. Then we can go on to this side. I just want to show this and then we'll answer a few questions. I'm going to flip it up um, upside down here because I'm in the way of this other um, finger joint on this, my side. And there we go. Just like that, we've got this nice pillowed shape running all the way around there. And I can do the same thing on the other four and we'll put this together and see how it goes. Well, actually, I don't know if I have to do that because you can kind of see how that comes out like that. That is about the shape. <laughs> but this is actually, this is my favorite part. This is really the enjoyable part where you get to just play with this and let it run into there. So what questions we got? So Thomas Foster asked, what suggestions do you have for inexpensive wood and projects that would help a person practice box and other jointery? Um, pine is usually a pretty easy wood to work with, um, but Pine is different than most hardwoods. So, I mean, a um, red oak is relatively common and relatively cheap for most places, though it is a little more difficult of a wood to work with. That being said, difficult woods often make really good learning woods because if you can do it in a difficult wood, then you can do it in any wood. But because it's so cheap, it's something that is... Um, you know, not going to hold you back. And you don't feel bad if you mess it up. And it's just red oak. It's not like white oak or anything. <laughs> so yeah, usually, I mean, whatever you can get your hands on, go ahead and use it. Uh, the, I, I do not subscribe to the thought that you should get an easy wood to learn on, um, just because easy does not actually mean better for learning. Easy just means that it's easier. So, yeah. What else we got? Um, hang on. I have to... I'm hanging. Shush. Oh, let me hang. I'm hanging. I throw things at you. I have a loaded pocket of writing <laughs> utensils. Yeah, I, that is I gotta be careful because she comes home with like syringes and scalpels and <laughs> never know what's gonna get thrown at me. <laughs> That's okay. I, I have a secret plan that I want to do someday. Uh, to you for a life, but I can't tell you because it would be really <laughs> funny if I could actually accomplish it. This is scary. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Anyways, um, so Moonwolf71 asks, when will we find out who won the tri-square and marking knife you and Yuri made together? Oh, um, 
I didn't announce them because it always makes people mad when I announce who won. So if you didn't get an email, um, then you didn't win it. Sorry. Well, <laughs> so yeah, I email out the winners and they've already been too. sent out. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd have to look them up and, and find the names on them. But I, I, I don't announce who actually won them anymore because that's just, it makes two people happy and makes 3,000 other people really unhappy. Apparently um, it wasn't you. Sorry. But yeah, those have already been sent out. And uh, they'll make a couple people happy, but uh, not you. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I had to. Gary Joy keeps asking, what are you building? And it's a box joint, correct? We're not, yep. There's no not actually building. making anything, just yeah. doing a joint work here. That was my thought. And uh, I actually, I have never used box joints in anything I've done with hand tools. I used them a lot when I was power tools because they're really easy to make with power tools. Um, but they are, I mean, if you're gonna do this, why not do dovetails? Unless you actually want the look of a box joint, which I generally don't. So yeah, what else we got? Uh, let's see, Steve just stuff asked, Sarah, are you all using OBS for the live broadcast? And I said, oh. <laughs> no, um, I'm using um, uh, XSplit. It's, it's uh, one you have to pay for. It's a little bit more solid than OBS. I used to use OBS, and it works really well, um, but it's just not quite as solid for what I want to do. And so I put in some money to buy XSplit, and it is a far more superior, far more stable, and has just as many bells and whistles, actually more bells and whistles, um, which you kind of expect with something you pay for. But if you don't have the money, I mean, OBS is great. And I used it for a couple of years, actually. So, yeah, XSplit's what I use now. <laughs> What's next? Almost there. One more cut. Oh, they keep saying that they need to now sharpen their chisels. Uh, let's see, Earl Soldier asked, if my saw's kerf is too wide, should I flatten it with a hammer or reset it and reset it or just buy a new saw? Um, no, you can stone it. Well, I guess that only happens if you're in, like, uh, California or Colorado, but... <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Here, let me just pull this out and then I'll show you an answer to that. So there we have it. The box joint. It's on there, and I'm actually really happy with that. There's well, that gap's even full there. There we go, box joint. And these pillows just they make it look a little bit more sharp, um, especially if you put them on the bottom of something, and then that you suddenly have feet that raise it up a little bit from the the, the surface. So, box joints. I'm noticing a definite lack of dad jokes tonight, all around. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, let me show you the best way to get rid of set. And honestly, um, if you, and I want to do a video here soon about this, is um, actually correcting the set. If you notice that your saw is always veering to the same side every time, that's because the teeth on the side that it's veering towards, those teeth are sticking out a little bit farther, making the saw curve in that direction. So what you can do is take a stone, and so if this, if this saw is cutting down, and it's veering this way out, that means the, the teeth on this side are sticking out farther. So I'm gonna take the stone and with just one or two passes, I'm gonna set it flat on the plate and slide it one, two, three, and then I'm gonna test it again and see if it, if it changes so it's not cutting one way or the other. And you're just taking off a little bit of material, but it's enough to change the set evenly over the course of the, the, the saw. So if you wanna take off the set, you can just take the stone and do four or five passes on this side, and then four or five passes on this side, and then test it. Um, and that is actually a, a really nice way because you get an even cut all the way across. And if you do it with something really coarse um, like that, um, well, you, like, like a, a coarse diamond plate is, is going to move you fairly slowly, but it's very consistent. If you need to move faster, then you can just grab a file and do the exact same thing. Take the handle off of the file. Do I have one without a handle here? Big one! So take the handle off the file and then slide that along two or three courses on this side, yeah. two or three courses on the other side, and you can bring that saw set back into control. That's the way I do it because it's far more controlled than taking a hammer and bashing it down Okay, there. you have got to fix your um, super oh. chat uh, 
Lights? Lights. Do I need to put lights back in there? Who who does that? Cut, cut twice. twice. In honor of missing. Oh, uh, okay. Let's do a let's do a uh, dad joke for cut. Wow, is it thirty six? Wow, that. Yeah, you. Like box it. joints are fast. <laughs> well, it takes about the same amount for dovetails. Um, but. So let's see. Um, ah, yesterday, yesterday I had this great epiphany. I invented a brand new word, plagiarism. I like that one. <laughs> it's better than some. <laughs> I crack myself up. <laughs> so should I tell you the one that B Power put up? Yeah, what's that? Puns make me numb, but math puns make me number. Number. <laughs> okay. There are too many good dad jokes out there. Okay. I just... It, the math puns made me think of how Arthur got mentioned in his end of the year letter. <laughs> yes. He asks everyone the square root of numbers, and he has just turned six. Yeah, he was doing square roots when he was four. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's doing his sister's third grade math in kindergarten. So. <laughs> All right. So what else we got? Adam Toth has an unrelated question. Yeah, we got lots of time for questions. So if you guys I have know. questions, Whoa, go and throw okay, them in there. Okay, they're getting. Hang on, before it disappears off my chat. Uh, what did he say? I have an unrelated question. I'm about to bite the bullet and buy a hand router plane. Should I just go for the Veritas or spend almost as much and get a Stanley Seventy One? Um. Yeah, the Veritas is just as good, if not slightly better. They've made a few adaptions to it, um, and they actually end up using the same cutters between the Veritas and the Stanley, so you can swap them back and forth. Um, and so if you have the money to get a Veritas, go get the Veritas. It's a great functioning tool. Um, now, the only reason you would, you would really hold out for a Stanley is that, number one, you want to save a little bit of money, and you can find one you can restore a little bit cheaper, though it's going to take more time. Or, number two, you just like the ethos of having an old tool. Um, but that being said, the Veritas is a really, really nice tool. Um, it's, it's just as good, if not better, than the original Stanley. Uh, there's, um, someone's going to help me out there. There's, there's another plane, there's another company that makes um, routers, and they're, they're rectangular, they're brass. Uh, I can't remember, but you can put the blade in the middle, or you can put the blade on the outside, or you can put the blades on the, the far outside and have far more surface. One of these days I want to get one of those, they're, they're really functional. Um, but I can't remember the name of the company. Oh well, I'll remember it later. I'm or waiting else for it, it to there. suddenly pop up on the chat, but it <laughs> up. yeah. Um, so Cut Choice just asked, "Do you know the Tom Lehrer song Lobachevsky?" I don't think I do. I I'll have to look it up later. No, more is it a more? A more? M O O, not a more. Hmm? <laughs> when? Um, no, more is that the name of the company? Or Peston? I don't know. I've got people Those throwing names. Those don't sound familiar. I don't know. Folks. I don't know. I'll remember it later. What else we got? That's all I got for the moment. Are there any other questions? No. Well, I think we might have to wrap this one up then. Are we cutting? Do it. Cut it early. What? <gasps> Sarah, have you been under tornado warnings? My phone hasn't gone dingling a ling saying yes, so I'm going to go no. <laughs> Nor do I hear a loud siren. No, the thunderstorm just passed us over a little bit ago, and we were heading fairly yeah, heavy thunder right at the beginning of this. But more had made a new one. More sounds familiar, but I, I have to, I'm trying to envision the logo in my head. Um. So probably more. I'll, I'll probably find a link of it for it later and put it up. So oh, now you got the questions coming in. So Earl Swartzer <laughs> just asked, is $60 too much to pay for three Diston saws on Craigslist? They have fancy handles. Um, it's more than I would generally spend because I find them everywhere I go. Um, and I, I, I turn down saws left and right. And I rarely pay more than three or five bucks for a saw, um, at least for like a for for panel saw or hand saw. Um, that being said, if they are in good condition, if they don't need restoration, or if they just need sharpening, then that's a good deal. Um, usually, the, the saws I'm paying three to five dollars for, I'm gonna have to spend some time scrubbing the plate down. I'm gonna have to spend some time fixing the teeth. Uh, I may have to do some repairs in the handle. 
um, and things like that. But if, if you find them in good shape, functioning, all they need is a little bit of sharpening, then that, that's, a, that's a good deal. Um, that, that's a functioning price. I, I, I'd pay that. Um, and it's not uncommon to find decent saws at like the swap meets that they're usually going for 30, 40 bucks for a panel saw or handsaw. Um, so that's, that, that, that's about the average going price for one that doesn't need much restoration, just needs to be um, sharpened. So yeah, depends on their quality. I like answering questions with, it depends. Oi, okay. Um, Gary Joy asks, do you do wood carving? Yes, I do quite a bit wood carving. Um, actually, if you look on the wall behind Sarah, there's several carvings up on the wall there, if the camera's pointed up high enough for them. Um, but I have quite a few videos on carving different techniques. Uh, most of what I do is just simple line carving with a V-tool. Uh, it's, it's a quick and easy way, and it's one of the easiest ways for people to get into carving. Uh, so that's, that's what I like to do. Once you can start to master that and master the hand work, uh, it goes well. Am I, am I really accomplished at carving? No, absolutely not. Um, but it's something that I very enjoy, and I like to put a little bit of carving in most of what I do. So, yeah. Uh, let's see, Matt, as the last, in your experience and opinion, are the new Stanley contractor grade planes on the same level of quality as the vintage Stanley planes, plastic handles, and totes notwithstanding? Uh, if you're talking about Stanley contractor grade planes, if you're talking about the ones you can generally find at the big box stores, no, those are trash. They're boat anchors. Do not buy them. They are worthless. They are only there so that the stores can say they sell hand planes. Now, if you're talking about the, the Stanley uh, sweetheart planes, which they have the, here, let me bring one over here. Uh, they'll have the, the sweetheart logo here. This is the low angle um, Stanley sweetheart plane. Um, these are cheap planes, and they're made with some fairly cheap pieces, such as this lever cap here is aluminum, and it feels cheap. But it functions really well, and I haven't had any issues, and I've never heard of anyone actually breaking these, um, unless there's some catastrophic problem. Um, they function really well. Are they, are they perfect? No. They take a little bit of tweaking. They take a little bit of getting used to. The handle isn't very comfortable. Um, the, the, there's a few things on them that are... Um, physically they just feel off but functionally it's a great plane and this is my go-to low angle plane um, it is it's, it's a great working plane um, are you going to be expecting Lee Nielsen or Veritas quality no but you're not gonna be paying half that price either um, I think that these are like uh, 125 bucks um, so you, you really can't go wrong with that uh, so the, the Stanley sweetheart line um, I like those they're they're good they're not perfect but they're good and for the price you pay, they are actually really good. Right. But yeah, if you're talking about the ones you get in Lowe's and Home Depot, uh-uh, not worth it. Um, they're, they're trash. Unless you want to make a scrub plane. They make good scrub planes. Let's see. Uh, Steve Does Stuff asks, how difficult would it be to convert the box joint to a wooden hinge? Uh, would not be that difficult. Actually, that would be kind of interesting because you just have to... You'd have to take one side and round it, and so you'd round the opposing sides. Um, well, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have them proud, so they'd have to be the, they'd have to be flushed, and then you'd just drive a pin through all of them, and you would have a hinge. So, yeah, that actually might make a good video making a wooden hinge like that. Maybe I'll try that sometime. Douglas Dyer Jr. asks, "What is your most favorite tool that you use?" Whichever one is currently in my hand at the time. <laughs> um, honestly, I, I love my hand tools. Uh, the, the compass plane is so much fun. A spoke shave is just incredibly enjoyable. It's one of those things you have to stop. Um, I love my Bearcat handsaw, the dovetail saw. This is thing is just it's incredible joy to use. Mallets, anything that I've made to fit me, um, just the, the feel, uh, my little carving mallet made with... Uh, live oak this is this is a joy to play with um, but usually it's whatever tool is currently in my hand if i had to pick one tool out of the entire shop it would be my half inch chisel um, and uh, this is just a a fantastic tool and i can do most anything um, i'm actually creating a, a video here where i'm going to be building a stool using only a chisel and i'm going to literally go out into the woods 
and chop down a tree and create a stool from a tree to stool with just a half inch chisel and a leather strop. So that is all I will be using to make it. So yes, um, with this, you can do most anything. So it's a great tool to have. Though having other tools is really nice. Along the same line, so we're living with Brian Franklin asks, what do you enjoy the most in the shop? Ah, oh, wood curls. Um, my wife, she's in the shop right now. She is the thing I enjoy the most out of anything. Not. <laughs> Tori runs and hides. <laughs> um, you know, I. one of the things that I'm trying to do with Wood by Wright is take it away from the project. And a lot of people really focus on the project and completing it and, and taking those final pictures and showing off this thing that they've made. And don't take me wrong, that, that's a lot of fun. When I finish this bed, I'm gonna be taking a lot of pictures and I'm gonna be showing it all over the place. But for me, the enjoyment isn't building something. It's not completing a project. It's not actually making something. For me, the enjoyment is using a chisel and getting these fantastic ingrain wood curls, um, having a tool that is set up perfectly and it just slides through the wood. That is just so much fun. Um, and so I'm, one of the goals of the channel is I really want to take the, the focus off of the project and put the, the focus on the actual work involved. Um, if you're not having fun doing each individual step, you're doing it wrong. Um, there are other ways to do things and you can always find a way that is fun for you. Um, now, is the way that I'm doing it fun for you? Probably not because I actually find the really hard, tedious ways to be very enjoyable. Um, but that's partly my personality. So for me, it's those little individual steps, making those perfect hand curls, um, having the, the end grain coming off, um, just seeing the wood come to life when the finish goes on. Those, those little in-between steps are, are really what I, what I enjoy the most. So let me get off my uh, soapbox here. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Bill Tiffin asks, is a Stanley Handyman plane worth restoring? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, they, well, the handyman plane went through many different iterations, and some of them are really good, and some of them have, are not. Um, when you start getting into the planes that were in the, the 70s and 80s with the plastic knobs, um, most of the time I'm going to say no. Uh, the, the quality started to go down to those, and they don't, say, they don't stay tuned up really well. They may, you, I mean, you can tune them up to do some really amazing things, but they just don't stay there. Um, and so for making a scrub plane or doing rough work, yes, they're good for that. But if you want a really nice, fine, smoother, then um, maybe some of the old ones, when they still have the, the metal adjustment knobs and things of that nature, then they're, they're, they're still decent planes. Um, but as they got a little newer, then, you know. Um, so it, yes, Handyman was a brand that was around for a while and went through many iterations. So you'll have to look at each individual, individual one. Ready? Yep. Brian Ross asked, would you consider doing another project like the live planter box? Uh, yeah, no, I would like to do another small project. And if you have any ideas, uh, feel free to put them in there. Or actually, the easiest thing, the best thing to do is send me an email. Um, I do look at all the emails that are sent through my website. Um, so, yeah, send that in there, and I'd love to hear ideas. I um, I can't guarantee I'm going to do it, but I do like doing small projects like that. Although the lives, I think, work really well with doing a step or a piece rather than building a project. So, yeah. Because yeah. it's real fun when you get your emails while we're watching a movie and your, your watch dings and lights up all the time. <laughs> I know when every email comes through. <laughs> Peter Travis asks, do you ever do chip carving? Yes, actually, my shoes are mostly chip carved. Let me show you this. Uh, doo. The one where I have a hole here where it got a little thin. But yeah, this whole surface is chip carved, and then I have my line carving down here. Um, so I've done a, a decent amount on there. I, I haven't done a whole lot of chip carving, but it is a very enjoyable thing to play with and uh, mess around with. So yeah, there you go. Oop, one button. There you go. All right, Steve does stuff asked, have you ever thought to get one of the kids a drum set so you can always have an accompanist to the dad jokes? And then <laughs> someone said, yeah, you need to make one so we can hit it at the end of. <laughs> I, I ain't going to let my kids anywhere near a drum set. <laughs> All kinds.
Come on now. <laughs> They're as loud enough as it is. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, What's that? Oh. Sorry, I'm trying to read, but I was yawning. Uh, so Moonwolf71 says, won't you need a mallet with the chisel when you go out to do your project? Maybe he makes the mallet. <laughs> no, actually, um, when I go out to do the project, uh, I literally picked up a stick on the ground and used that as the mallet. Um, so no, I did not even have a mallet. I don't have a bench. I don't have any work holding device. It's just me out in the woods with a chisel and a strop. And of course, a cameraman. Need a cameraman. <laughs> uh, let's see. MVFD1224S. I'm new to hand tool woodworking. What are some tools I can't live without? Half inch chisel. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, honestly, when I got started in woodworking, I had a set of chisels. Um, the well, the, the first set of chisels I had were these ones. They're the Harbor Freight uh, wooden handled chisels. They're not the best in the world. Um, they don't hold an edge really well, but they do hold an edge decently well. Um, and so, for a beginner, this is a great place to start. And you can pick up a whole set of these for seven bucks. Um, comes with I think six chisels. Uh, so I had a set of these. I had a number four that I picked up at a garage sale and restored. Um, it was actually a union um, hand plane. Um, and then I had a, a plastic handle saw that I bought at the big box store with a, it was $5 saw with a $5 mail and rebate. So it was free. So for $12, I started with a set of chisels, a number four and a saw. And with that, I started building my bench, and I started building other to other things that came along. Um, and I usually say from that point on, after you have a good set of chisels, uh, you have a saw, and you have a hand plane, after that, all you really need, well, other than a way to sharpen those, you need to have a sharpening system. Um, after that, you just need to buy tools as you need them. Don't buy tools that you don't currently have a need for. Um, so. Don't go and buy a tool because you see a tool. Go and buy a tool because you need it to complete a project. Um, and so don't, don't get the tool until you have the project that needs it. So <laughs> that's usually my, my best word of advice for people collecting tools for the beginner is uh, if you don't have a project right now that you're working on that needs it, then don't get it. it sounds kind of obvious, but it's a really hard thing for a lot of people to do. <laughs> what else? So then they just need to do a project that needs it. I already know how that's how you get your stuff. Hey, babe, do you need... Uh, uh -huh. You could really use one of these, babe. <laughs> I wonder what I'll get for Christmas this year. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, Zizi asks, any tips on sharpening chisels with only sandpaper? Yeah. Um, it, it depends on the surface you have underneath it. If the surface is soft, you're going to end up rounding over your blade. Um, what I actually do is have a scrap piece of glass, which I don't have here, it's on the other side. Um, so I just got a, a chunk of glass that I found at a garage sale um, or wherever, put a piece of glass on the bench and use that to, to sharpen with. Um, and either tape down the um, sandpaper or if you're comfortable with your hand, just hold it in place and sharpen across that. Um, Sandpaper is cheap and quick way to get into sharpening, but it is expensive in the long run. Um, so it just it depends on what you want to do. It's also a little slower because um, sandpaper doesn't cut as fast as um, a good water stone or as fast as diamonds. But yeah, it's a great way to get into it. And I started with some sandpaper too. What else? Actually, we're getting close to the end here. How many questions do we have left? We are. Um the only thing left that I see is, can you make a toy log cabin using real twigs? <laughs> I have thought about doing some Lincoln Logs. Um, doing a, a set of Lincoln Logs would be an interesting project. Really fairly quick and easy to make. But uh, yeah, not yet. All right, that's it. Let's wrap it up. Cool. Uh, so I don't have an idea for next week yet. Um, let me know if there's something particular you'd like to see me make or something, some joint you'd like to see done, if there's something interesting. I have thought about doing inlaid box joints, um, though I think that might be taking a step too far. 
<laughs> Although doing the hinge, that, that's an interesting idea. I might do that. Um, so we'll see how that goes next week. If you want to join me Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Central Time. I kept saying Eastern Time. Central Time, 8 p.m. And uh, we will be here. So I think that's about it. Anything I'm forgetting? Do I have anything else? Cool. Mm -hmm. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye.